says, uh, here's what happens at my house, because two of our boys came back, from uh, one from grad school, one from uh, college this past weekend, and our other, we have three boys. Here's what happens for in this season, because they're home for Thanksgiving. <laughs> or, they go over here and they go, it's that turning uh, shelves, right? has all the food, the junk food in it. They kick it open, and they go, let me get you in here. They're searching. What are you doing? I'm, like, I'm just hungry. I'm searching for something to eat, right? That's all they're doing. They're searching. Uh, so my question is, what are you looking for in this season? Uh, we're in a season of looking for things. We're also biblically in a season of looking for things. As we move towards Christmas, uh, John the Baptist is looking for the Messiah. We'll hear about that later on as we move toward Christmas. On Christmas Eve, we'll hear about the, the shepherds looking for the Messiah. Uh, later on, the wise men will be looking for the Messiah as they see the star. Um, Mary and Joseph will be looking for a place to have the Christ child. Uh, we're in a season of looking for things. And not to mention, certainly, uh, the gifts and all the things that come with this season as well. It's a searching time. It's a looking for time. But let me ask you something even deeper. I mean, on one level, that's true, biblically and uh, spiritually, bib- biblically and just life in general. But on a deeper question is this. What's your heart looking for? You know, what is, what is even deeper? What is your heart looking for? And what might God bring to you during this season that you're searching for and you can't find it, but God can know what your heart is looking for. And that's where we want to land today. What's your heart looking for? I mean, we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, uh, Russell read it, and I really important words as far as what was on his heart and his companion's heart. As Paul writes, um, night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again. That is the Christians in Thessalonica who he's writing to and supply what is lacking in your faith. But he's only praying night and day because what's on his heart is yearning on his heart is he just wanted to see these people again. That's what's on Paul's heart if we had to ask him a question, that same question. So you might have your own answer and you probably do. So take a moment and think, what is it? Searching for meaning, hope, relief, freedom. Is your heart looking for identity? Are you looking for peace? What is it? What are you looking for? So in 1987, one of my favorite bands of all time, which I'll tell you that group in a second. uh, In 1987, on April 12th, they filmed a video that played on the MTV you can still go to YouTube and find it, or whatever, on Google. And uh, on that day, in the evening of that day, they were in Las Vegas. They filmed a video that was basically one camera. It was a very basic video. It took them three hours to film, which was fast for a video. Okay? And there was a band of four guys, and they walked down the street on Fremont Street in Las Vegas. Now, Fremont Street in Las Vegas, I've only been to Las Vegas a couple times. I don't really know Fremont Street that well, but from what I know is Fremont Street, at least is the historic casino street, right? Uh, it's way bigger now than it was even in, 80, in the 80s. So these bands walking down the street, and they're singing their song, and it's at night, and there's a crowd of people around them watching this happen. It's a, kind of a, that's the way the video is shot. And they purposely filmed it at night because the lights would be shining brightly. And they filmed it in a speed of film that would make it not clear, not as clear as like high definition, uh, and the, well, whatever high definition, different, the high definition meant in 1987. But uh, it wasn't as clear as it could have been so that the lights would like have not as, that weren't clear, they were like, had this really a lot of brightness to them. And those are the lights of the casinos on that street. And those lights of the casinos at night are beckoning these passers-by, these tourists, and these people who live there to come on in. Come on in and spend some money. Maybe you can find some riches 
and you'll finally have some luck. And so they juxtapose, juxtapose, maybe not even juxtapose, they purposely put this song on that street on that day. And here's the song. As they walk down the street, Bono sang, I have climbed highest mountains. I have scaled these city walls, these city walls, only to be with you. And he goes on, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for, right? He's singing that song on Fremont Street in a city where people are looking for something. That's purposely why they did it. And they sang that song, which became, since 1987, a still to this day, very day, they called a rock and roll hymn. It's a hymn about yearning. But it's not a hymn about, uh, not written just for people who don't believe. Actually, Bono and the others believe in Jesus. They are Christians. The third verse in that song tells us that. He writes, I believe in the kingdom come when all the colors will bleed into one Bleed into one, right? He's talking about the second coming. He believes this. But he says, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And he's pointing out that even believers in Christ can still have a yearning of the heart of looking for something that that belief is not touching yet. It's not there. I believe it. But something deeper is just a, a yearning for something else, what's happening here. And that's what Bono is honestly singing in that song. So there you go. You know my favorite band of all time, U2. And it's a great song. And that song, if you go to a U2 concert, even to this very day, they will in the, purposely put in that concert a place where they take a break and the crowd takes over that refrain. Whether you believe in Christ or not, human beings are looking for things. And that phrase echoes around the arenas from the voices of those who are watching you too, whether they can sing or not, they all start singing, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for, right? Because human beings are looking for things. In the gospel lesson, Jesus points out something about our hearts. He says, do not let your hearts, and be careful that your hearts are not weighed down with carousing, and drunkenness, and the anxieties of this life. Prior to that, he talks about the unraveling of the universe, right? He begins to begin to talk about how they, this is going to happen, these bad things are going to happen, these bad things are going to happen, but stand up and watch the Son of Man is coming again, and don't let your hearts be weighed down in these places, in these times. So in one sense, he's saying, don't let your hearts weigh down. That's a negative way, a positive way we might say, but let your hearts be free. That's what Jesus is saying. Let them be joyful and filled with something, even as you see the unraveling of things. Even as we see the unraveling of the Ohio State Buckeyes against the Michigan Wolverines yesterday. There's the Michigan Wolverine fan. There's one. <laughs> Two, three, three more. All right. But, I mean, you see these things and you think, what is going on in the world? Jesus says, take heart. Your heart is searching for something, and it might be being filled with anxiety now. But just be careful. Be careful in those times. Jeremiah, I mentioned before, that we read the prophet Jeremiah from chapter 33. We, have, we didn't read the first 32 chapters. Jeremiah had a long history of the people of Israel. He had been with, with, with the Lord for many, many years, decades, since he was a child, called it to be a prophet. Uh, and he lived in the, in the nation of Judah, and Judah was the southern kingdom of two kingdoms. Israel at that time was the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. Uh, in the 700s, the Babylonians came in and destroyed, the Assyrians came on and destroyed the kingdom of Israel, and then they were threatening, in 587, they were threatening to move into Judah. The prophet Jeremiah was saying, this is going to happen, guys. God's saying, watch out, the enemy of our nation is coming, and they're going to destroy us. And in 588, the Babylonians surrounded the city of Jerusalem, destroying towns along the way, taking captive is Jewish people as well and sending them back to Babylon. And now Jeremiah and the residents of Jerusalem are, are under siege by the Babylonians around the city walls. 
587, the Babylonians break in and they literally destroy the city. And they put, and King Zedekiah was the king. And Jeremiah was, I think, whether Zedekiah did it or I'm not sure who did it. But somebody put Jeremiah in prison in a courtyard as if they can shut him up. And Jeremiah 33, the portion we read, is a longer portion. And the context of it is, Jeremiah, it says in verse 1, that he's in, in the courtyard in prison. And he might be able to look out across the courtyard and see all the destruction of Jerusalem, including the temple itself. For a Jewish person, especially in those days, but even today, to see the city of God, the temple of God, completely flattened would be the most heinous, unraveling, universal thing that you could ever imagine. And Jeremiah could just look around at the destruction and say, what hope is left? There's nothing left. And the audacity of God to speak in that moment. Because even though Jeremiah was holed up in a courtyard as a prisoner, nothing can hold God's word back. Because God spoke through Jeremiah as he was in prison. And God says, Jeremiah, tell the people, the days are surely coming. Oh, just wait. I know your hearts are weighed down by anxiety right now, but just wait. There's a day coming when everything will be restored. It doesn't look good now, but trust me, God says through Jeremiah, I am doing a new thing here. And I will do a new thing. And you're not going to see it tomorrow. But let your hearts take courage. Let your hearts be filled with hope and joy, even as you look around and see nothing. Now, we might not be there physically, like we've not seen the city of Columbus, thankfully, destroyed like that. I hope we never do. But sometimes we're emotionally there. Sometimes our hearts are weighed down with grief and anxiety and hopelessness, and we go, man, what can happen? What, what good can happen here? I'm not sure anything can happen. The disciples, uh, the, the apostles, were in prison by the Romans, and God broke into the prison and broke their chains and freed them because nothing can hold God back. And God can even meet us in those empty places emotionally or spiritually or physically. And God can do amazing things. And God does amazing things. Let me give you a quick for instance. So many years ago, I had to, I was, it was around this time. It was the October, first of October, first week of October, probably 12 years ago, a long time ago. And I was in a season, for me, it was a season of just, I was, it was empty. It was just really, I was in a hard time in my personal life and some difficult times professionally as well. But God was faithful. We're, we're moving forward as day by day, right? But there were di- nights that just was full of anxiety. And I, had, I remember I had to preach the following Sunday, and it was a really difficult few weeks prior to that. And I was preparing to preach, and I, I'm going, God, I don't got nothing to preach about this Sunday because I'm really in a hard place. So I remember driving. I was at a pastor's retreat at Deer Creek State Park. And I drove back from Deer Creek, uh, and I'm driving back to Columbus, and God says, I want you to go to Barnes & Noble. I'm telling you, God told me. He goes, go to Barnes & Noble. I want you to find a book by Mike Iaconelli called Messy Spirituality. I knew the title. I knew the, I knew who the author was. I, I, I've seen Mike Iaconelli speak. I knew kind of the title, what I knew about the book. But it was really clear. Go to Barnes & Noble. And I went to Easton to Barnes & Noble. And I remember walking into Easton and going, okay, go find the Christian section because Iaconelli is a Christian author. And I'm looking, and they're all alphabetical. A's, B's, C's, D's. I've got to find the end of the alphabet. And that's out the bottom. So I had to bend down, and I'm looking W, X, Y, Y, is Yancey. No, Yacinelli. I don't see a Yacinelli. Well, I just wasted my time coming over to Easton. Maybe I heard God wrong. And I, I did not see a Yacinelli at all. Then I, you know, whatever the authors and Z's were there, but uh, W to Z, but no Yacinelli. 
So I, it was down here, literally, and I remember turning around. Sorry, my back's to you, but this is what happened. Turned around because the front of the alphabet was over here. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, what about, maybe it's Brent, maybe I heard it wrong. Is Brennan Manning, another one of my favorite authors, does a lot of great, authored a lot of books. Brennan Manning. So I go to M's, Brennan Manning, 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 Manning. And I'm like, oh, there's Brennan Manning. I'm looking for the right title. And I, as I'm doing it, God said to me, Weaver? I said Iaconelli. And I'm, I'm telling you, I'm sitting there and looking around like, wait a minute, does somebody just, okay. I didn't say anything. And I'm looking out again and tucked between, literally, it was between two books because it's a smaller book, was this one copy of the book I was looking for by Mac Iaconelli, Messy Spirituality. I still have that book today. And I picked it out and looked at it, and it was the exact right thing I needed. And what God was saying to me, God, Mike, life is messy. It is. Our hearts do get weighed down with anxiety and sadness and despair and anger and frustration. It happens. That's life. And sometimes we feel imprisoned. But God meets us in those places and he just used Mike Iaconelli's book to show me something that I could say on Sunday morning. I didn't give a book report on Sunday morning. Don't get me wrong, right? <laughs> By the way, let me just read to you the first chapter of Mike Iaconelli. I didn't do that. But he helped inspire me for that sermon, a sermon that was beyond my ability to speak that day. I was, and I'm not saying, all I'm saying is I was in a place where I was just open to let God do what only God can do. And I'm not, just, I'm not anything special. That's for all of us. We all are in that place sometimes. And God can do and meet us in places, in those places, and meet that need to move us forward to a better day tomorrow. Jesus said, the grown Jesus said this. It's recorded in the Gospels. Seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will be added unto you. He's saying that in the context of a teaching about worry. Because even Jesus knows our hearts can be weighed down even with that, with worry. That our hearts are searching for help in the worry. Peace in the worry. Trust in the worry. And Jesus says, if you're searching for those things, seek not for trust, seek my kingdom. Because when you get my kingdom, Jesus, who is Jesus, you get me, you get everything. Identity and purpose and meaning and hope and grace and joy and relief. Because Jesus is the author of all those things and gives it to us freely. Sometimes in the physical thing of a book. Sometimes in the physical thing of the word spoken, that is, the Bible. Sometimes through friends and family. Sometimes through various and sundry other things that only God can use to speak to our hearts and to fill them not with anxiety with the, with the, as we see the difficulty around us or we feel it. Instead, fill us with the joy and peace that God promises as we seek him. So my friends, what is your heart seeking today? Instead of seeking for that, seek for the kingdom of God Jesus' presence in your life and everything else will become with it. That's Jesus' promise to us. He'll comfort us. He'll strengthen us. He'll bring us relief and hope and joy. And that's where we land today. Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, um, you have come for us, Jesus, as the Prince of Peace. And so we ask that as we celebrate today your presence among us, that Prince of Peace in every single one of our hearts and minds, that you would speak truth and kindness and grace. Would you fill us with that gift, those gifts that only you can give and break through our lives, into our lives, so that, Lord, we are refreshed and renewed, that today, tomorrow, next weeks and years ahead are better than they are today because you reign and live and love us. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.